Thank you, Mr. Kirkby. We'll let you know. These days, it's nothing more than a valuable antique, but when this phonograph first hit the market in 1904, it and the phonographs that preceded it were part of a minor miracle. These things, with their wax cylinder recordings, altered forever the way human beings enjoy themselves. For the first time, music was available at will in the house to those not rich enough to support a private orchestra. The first recording ever made was of these words. Mary had a little lamb, it squeaked as white as snow, and everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to grow. That was in 1887. The speaker was Thomas Edison himself. Florence Nightingale, describing the Battle of Balaclava, followed. So did many other recordings of music and poetry. Tennyson, reading selections from Maud, was very popular around 1890. But cylinders were eventually replaced by flat recordings. This is the Edison Diamond Disc of 1889. Bakelite and shellac, fragile, heavy and very, very thick. As 78s progressed, they uh, lost a bit of weight. As the records changed, so of course did the players. This is the ram's horn player, obvious where it got its name. The sound is taken mechanically down here and then travels acoustically up the tube and out of the horn, no amplifiers or electronics there. Sometimes these ones came with bamboo needles that had to be sharpened after every single record. By the 1920s, this was the height of elegance. It had metal needles, literally needles, very sharp indeed, and a very heavy head. It also had to be wound mechanically. Electricity, of course, was the power source by the 50s when the gramophone and the radio shared a cabinet making the radiogram. The microgroove, long-playing record now began to dominate the market, and with minor improvement, it's been with us ever since. But isn't there something better? And what you've just been listening to is the ultimate in recorded sound. It will make all conventional disc and cassette systems obsolete. It's dustproof, scratchproof, digitally recorded, read by a laser, and it's called the compact disc. And that's it. The biggest revolution in the recording industry since the invention of the long playing gramophone record. But this is no ordinary disc, just 12 centimeters in diameter. The music is recorded onto it digitally, and there's no needle being dragged through a groove. That information is being read by a laser light. And this is the tiny laser that does all the work. A small, low power semiconductor which emits invisible infrared light and plays the record from inside out. Magnified 12,000 times, this is what the surface of the compact disc looks like. You can see the thousands of tiny pits and grooves which the laser has cut into a thin plastic sheet. When it's monitored or read off by another laser in the playback machine, the lengths of the grooves and the distances between them give varying light patterns which are then picked up by a tiny diode. And unlike a conventional gramophone disc, this is totally proof against fingerprints and dust because the information is stored underneath a plastic film. It doesn't really matter how much I manhandle that particular disc, it will still continue to give very good audio quality. This is a one-sided disc. On the other side is simply the label of the record. And the record player which plays it is also surprisingly small and compact. That information is read by a laser from the underside. You simply place the disc in there like a conventional record player, and off you go. Introducing new technology in a popular market has its own problems. Take the battle between cartridges and cassettes. It confused the consumer mightily, and it took around a decade for cassettes to establish a clear lead. The big manufacturers have learnt from that experience. With the laser audio disc, two of the biggest, Philips and Sony, have united to produce compatible hardware. Half a world away from Holland in Tokyo, Ian Finlay found that although their players look different, 
The discs are exactly the same. Just put it into pause for a moment. The, uh, the thing is that it's very difficult to try and get across the sound to you now, like this, when you're listening on conventional uh, TV set, and uh, also we're recording on a conventional tape recorder, so we can't actually get across to you in, a, in sound terms. Uh, what this thing can do, but basically it revolves around five things. The background noise. The background, there's practically no, no background noise at all, no hiss or anything like that. There's no wow or flutter. Uh, distortion is only 0.05%, which is uh, very, very good, as any hi-fi buff will know. Frequency response is um, roughly similar to existing hi-fi sets, between 20 and 20,000 hertz. Uh, the main thing to say about the frequency response though, is that it's absolutely flat. No pits or heights in it at all. And uh, finally, the most important thing is the dynamic range is remarkable. 90 dB, which uh, uh, hi-fi buffs will, will uh, agree is very, uh, is, is very remarkable. The player itself is a huge advance over conventional record players because it gives you the same sort of control you have on a tape recorder. Fast forward and fast reverse scanning, pause and stop buttons, and the ability to instantly select any track you want. It's also got a little programmable memory so that instead of playing the tracks in their right order, one, two, three, four, five, and so on, you can select your own sequence in advance so that they play in any order you want. And all the while, the monitor tells you which track you're on and how many minutes and seconds it's been playing. In addition, the whole thing, all of that, a uh, little computerized marvel is packed into something which you can pick up and move around like that, even shake, and nothing happens, which is quite incredible. And uh, means that it's got enormous potential uh, eventually, once in the future, it's perhaps made a little bit more compact uh, for the uh, car audio industry as well. The players are due for release at the end of 82 in Japan and the United States, in Australia and Europe, sometime in 83. They'll cost between six and eight hundred dollars and the discs should be no more expensive than records now. In a way it all sounds too good to be true. Other systems have, heaven knows, failed to live up to their pre-release promises to change the way we listen. Quadraphonic sound, for instance, died of starvation when not enough quad records were released. But with compact discs we're assured there will be a rolling river of material. Seven major record companies have already signed up to produce on the system. With hardware and software both lined up, compact discs may well rule the roost, at least until someone perfects a method of putting Beethoven's ninth on a silicon chip. Don't laugh. I'm assured that that day, in fact, is not too far off. <laughs>